ready? You ready? Grab your Bibles. Say, this is my Bible. It is God's unchanging word. It is God eternally speaking to me. It is incorruptible seed that fills my heart. It rules my mind. And when spoken from my mouth, it moves mountains. Now say amen. And you can be seated. Yeah. So when pastor asked me if I wanted to bring the word and I, I accepted, I went to the Lord and I said, you know, I'd like to bring a timely word. I don't want to just get up here and babble. I want to bring something to you that you could take away. You could take it away and you could do something with it. So does that sound like that's good? And what's even better is it didn't take long for me to get something for God to say that this is going to be a powerful message that you can take and you could apply in your life. So how many of you would like to know, not guess, but actually know what to do whenever you need guidance or whenever you face anything in life? I know I would. Well, that's what we got today. That's the message that's coming today. And so for those of you that are taking notes, how far can I walk to the left and the right? That's okay? Okay. The master key belongs to you. That's the title of this message. So when God gives you a message, and when he gives you the title of the message, I think it's pretty cool. So you know, in life, we face many, many challenges every day. Sometimes things go easy, and sometimes things are not so easy. And I don't know about any of you, but it doesn't seem like things get any easier for myself. Maybe it appears as if they do, but it doesn't seem like it to me. But I know that God's word doesn't change. I know that God watches over his word to perform it. And I know that my responsibility is to take his word and to apply it in my life. And then I could sit back and know that God's going to do something for me. Right? So what you face could be so, something that seems so seemingly insignificant to others, okay, or could be a major deciding factor to you in your life. So it really doesn't matter what's important to Brother Bill or insignificant to him. What matters is that it's important to you so that it's important to God. So... There's a master key, a master key. Now, I know years ago, there's old homes and they had a, a skeletal key. And they were pretty cool because there was a master key that would unlock any lock. And it was pretty cool to stick that in there. I don't know if those of you have ever seen those keys. And they have master keys today and they unlock anything. Now, I'm not talking about the keys of the kingdom when Jesus said, I give you the keys of binding and loosing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different key. And it is the master key. That master key, you want to know what it is? Something so simple. It's God's wisdom. God's wisdom is that key. But you say to yourself, well, if it's that simple, how do I get God's wisdom? Ask. Huh. Today, right now, today, right here is the day. The Bible says that faith is now. The Bible says that faith is present tense. And God has given to each one of us a measure of faith. And the measure that he's given us is the God kind of faith because he doesn't have any other kind but his own. Guess what? That faith is yours. So, Hebrews 11, verse 1, out of the New King James Version, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen. The New Living Translation says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about the things we cannot see. So, does it take much faith to go to work and expect a paycheck at the end of the week? No, you just kind of expect it. Does it take faith when you work for yourself to have money come in so you can pay your bills? Yes. 
I've been working for myself for 31 years. I'm only 35. But, but all joking aside, it's been 31 years. God supplies all my need, and he does it according to his riches in glory. And whether I take a check once a month or once every couple of months, my job is not to worry about where is that money coming from and how is God going to get it to me. My job is to believe and then receive and forget about the rest. I like the way Kenneth Copeland says that we need to be consistently constant whenever we're facing a crisis or whenever things aren't going our way, you are to act as if nothing has changed. So, so what? You haven't taken a check in three weeks. Three weeks. Did God's word change? No. But if you have a paycheck and it's there week after week after week, you get your bonuses, life is good, I have no money issues, you really don't stretch your faith for finances, and you don't know what it's like to stretch your faith for finances until you have to do so yourself. If God's your source, forget the rest. If your best client threatens to get somebody else, let them go, because God will bring 10 more up the road. Don't even worry about it. Pastor Artie's son, Chris, worked for me for a while, and he knows some of the clients that I have that could be very demanding, very challenging, make you want to lay the five-fold ministry on them as soon as you see them. But you have to refrain yourself from doing so because, first of all, you get arrested, and second of all, if we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, what kind of representation would I be of the gospel to act that way? <laughs> right or wrong? So, so in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17, it says, So then faith, it comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So what you're telling me then is faith actually comes when I hear the word. Yeah. So you mean it's that simple that when I hear the word, faith automatically comes? Yes. When you walk into the room and you turn on the light switch, the lights automatically come on. Electricity travels at such an enormous speed, so fast that it's instant, right? Well, faith, you want faith? You want the God kind of faith? You've already been given the measure of that? Your faith grows when you hear the word. When you sit under the teaching of the word, your faith is there. When you read the word, faith is there. When you speak the word, faith is there. So, let's go to the book of Proverbs. That's not my heartbeat. <laughs> All right, so let's see if I can do this on this. Proverbs, go to Proverbs and go to chapter 4. And what I'd like you to do is go to verse 7. And it says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So, that means that if it's the principal thing, then it's the most important element. I said if wisdom is the principal thing, it means that wisdom is the most important element in what you need. Listen to what I'm telling you. It means it's the first thing we need to do. It means the very first thing you need to do is seek God's wisdom on what do I do. You don't worry. You don't get into fear. Fear. I say things a different way. <laughs> I'm not going to the fair, but you don't want to be in fear. That's the English language for you. You go to God and you ask him for wisdom. Father, I don't know what to do. And you say in your word to ask. So I look for wisdom. So turn over to the book of James. Is this good so far? I got to tell you, when God gave it to me and I said, my God, how many times have we read all this? You're telling me that this is this powerful message that you have for me to deliver tomorrow? Yes, it is. Wisdom is the most important thing. Brother Sal and I had the good fortune of becoming very close with the late Mother Jenkins. And when I sat at her feet many times, and I just wanted to hear what this woman had to say, this powerful woman of God. You know what she told me years ago? It's God's wisdom, honey. <laughs> Seek God's wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5. 
The New King James Version says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now listen to the Amplified Version. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or a circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. But I want you to hear the Message Bible. You know what it says? It says, if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. So how many of you would go to your natural father and expect him to put you down to be condescending when you're asking him for guidance? You wouldn't expect your natural father to be that way, would you? So why would you expect Father God to be that way? If he gave his only son for us, for you, for me, why would you expect him to turn his back on you when he told you that if you need wisdom, ask? If you don't know what you're doing, ask. Ask. Let me tell you something. I printed this out. Looks like it's a lot, but it's really not. I made it big since I got bifocals. I need a little bigger. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> it's big, so it means you got to listen. So, so it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, so listen to these different descriptions taken out of the dictionary, okay? It's the Italian dictionary, so pay attention. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks the trait of utilizing knowledge and experience with common sense and insight, ask God. If any of you lacks the quality of being prudent and sensible, ask God. If any of you lacks the ability to apply knowledge or experience or understanding or common sense and insight, ask God. If any of you lacks accumulated knowledge or enlightenment, ask God. That's just de descriptions of wisdom that I apply to what God said in his word. It's very simple. God is saying that if you don't know what to do, ask him. But when you ask him, believe that he's going to answer you. Listen, many of us are in a hurry today because... We live in a society that we want it now. My kids grown up with a point and click society and they expect a response as soon as they click the mouse. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes God responds that way, but not always. So rather than living your life stressed, there's a saying we, we laugh and say we're too blessed to be stressed. It's true. What are you gonna be stressed about? If you're stressed, it means you're worrying about the situation or the circumstance hello, and you're not trusting that God's going to take care of it. You're not trusting that he's going to tell you what to do. You know, in my own life, I've been feeling a certain way. Look, I'm spitting like you, Pastor. That must be good, huh? I'm feeling a certain way, and I've been seeking the Lord, and I'm asking him what to do. I don't have the answer yet. So what do I do? I do nothing. I don't make a wrong decision because I have an agitated spirit. I wait. I wait patiently on the Lord. I, a I act as if it's already been given to me, and I thank him for it every day that I have his wisdom. So, there's an important thing to remember. Verse 6, it says, New King James Version, it says, to let him ask in faith without doubting, right? So if you see a wave in the way the waves are going all over the place, if they're moving all over the place and it's windy and everything else, you can, you're literally in every direction. Every direction, you don't even know what you're doing. You're running around like a chicken with no head. God doesn't want you to be that way, right? So you're supposed to ask boldly. You're supposed to believe without taking a second thought. Do you trust God? Do you have faith in God? Do you know how much he loves you? He doesn't want you stressed. He doesn't want you to stress about it. People who worry their prayers, they worry them. 
The message translation says they're like wind-whipped waves. Don't pray worried prayers. Don't think that you'll get anything from the master that way, keeping all your options open. You know what? Let me just keep this option open just in case. Just in case God doesn't come through. Forget it. You're not going to get anything from him. There's no plan B. It's plan A. It's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else is going to be added to you. Forget seeking after the things. Okay? It's funny how this year we're supposed to be looking at colleges for my other daughter. So now I have one in college, and I'm paying her rent in some high-rise apartment down in Philly out of my pocket and paying her tuition out of my pocket. But before she started the school, I didn't have that extra money. It wasn't there. I couldn't even think of paying the amount of money I pay a month. It's more than my mortgage. But somehow, some way, God has managed to come through for me. So do you think it's going to be any less different with my second child? You know what? It will be if I say it will be. But if I trust God, if I have faith in God, if I ask him for the wisdom on how to handle the affairs in my own life, God's going to come through for me because he's never failed me yet. Okay? So, once you ask God for wisdom, do not start worrying. And don't start wondering about the what-ifs. Thank him and wait on him for the wisdom that you just asked for. Well, what happens when the thoughts come to my mind because nothing's happening? So what? What about when I went through what I did where they were going to take my house? I walked the perimeter of my property, and I pled the blood of Jesus around it, over and under it, and said, no man will take my house from me. I declared that that's my property. I don't care how many times they denied me. I kept going back and back and back and back, and I told you what happened. My second mortgage got erased, and I offered them five grand on a $160-something-thousand-dollar mortgage or whatever it was. And my wife started laughing, but she laughed her way to victory because they took it. Now, I'm going through the tax ramifications because of it, and I'm paying them off, but it doesn't matter. God will do for you what you expect him to do. He will do no more, and he will do no less. So if you expect God to do nothing, he will not disappoint you. Guaranteed, you won't be disappointed. But if you raise your expectancy, God will do for you. I can declare to you, and I've been, I am believing God to pay my mortgage off. I am believing him to have me debt-free because I declare it to be so. But I'm also asking him for the wisdom on what I need to do in my own life. I tell you these things so that hopefully they will help you. I didn't build a barn and take the money out of the pocket because God didn't give it to me and cause it to come in. I didn't have it stashed under the matrax like my grandparents used to do. <laughs> When I had to redo my septic system, he caused a job to come in to pay for the whole thing in full and still be able to tithe on top of it. Every single thing I've needed, he's provided for me. In addition to being able to buy a classic car outright cash, which is phenomenal. These are things that God wants to do for you. He wants to see you happy. He wants to see you blessed. He doesn't want to see you stressed. You cannot afford to stay out of church. We use cordless drills, and when they're fully charged up, boy, they work good. But when they stay out of the charger, and you use them, and you use them because there's demands put on them, hello, and you use them because you need to, but you don't recharge, you eventually lose your charge. You become weak and battered, and you need to plug in, okay? You can't believe the lie and stay out of church. You can't believe the lie and start putting... Brother bucket breath down because he sits next to you and he stinks and you can't start putting the pastor down and his family and What's this and what's that you need to set that crap aside? I can say crap. Can I you need to set that nonsense aside? Nonsense nonsense don't take notes. Don't take notes. You can edit that out. You need this You need to you need to put that nonsense aside you can't even go there because listen what we face every day is real it's real. Now listen. Once God's Holy Spirit tells you what to do, do it. Faith requires an action. So if you do nothing, nothing changes. You know, people say that one explanation, right, 
One explanation that you would say is, if I do nothing and I expect change, wh what is that? Nothing's going to happen, right? So you could do the same thing day in and day out, expect things to change, nothing will. Five years go by, you're in the same position, nothing changed. Well, what did you do different? If you're heading in this direction, and you're supposed to be going that direction, but all you do is keep going in this direction, how are you going to turn around and head in this direction unless you make the change to do it? God's not going to do it for you, but he's placed the inward witness, the Holy Ghost, on the inside of us to tell us what to do, when to do it, how to do it. That's who you need to follow. Trust me, I've gone off to the wrong road and gone on some rabbit trail. Once I finally realized I was going in the wrong direction, then I made the change, and it took me years to come right back to where I was, and I said, wait a minute, this is a familiar place. I've been here before. Wait, wait, I don't want to be here, and I'm not going back that way because that didn't work. Father, what do I need to do? Gee, you think you would have asked me back then? Well, it would have been a lot easier, wouldn't it have? No, I thought I knew it all. Anytime you make a mistake in life, most of the time it's because you're in a hurry, because you're in a rush, because you want it done now. Listen, you have to believe that God wants the best for you. How can you be a blessing to others if you're not blessed yourself? You can't. And I don't just mean financial. I mean just to be a blessing to someone. If you're depressed and, and just in a bad mood all the time, who's going to want to be around you? Believe me, I'm around some foul-mouthed talking people and I laugh sometimes at it, but other times there's just some negativity coming off of people. I'm like, man, I gotta get away from this. It's just the vibes coming off of them I don't like and I don't wanna be around it. You have to be the light when you walk into the room. You know, if, if you're talking to someone and they're excited, they're kinda nice to be around, but if you're talking to someone and they're all miserable and their, their head is down and they're all, you know, you're not even gonna be around them. When I used to have a store out in Chicago area and people would walk in my personality maybe doesn't fly well out there. I don't know. Hey, how you doing? Fine. That's how the people would respond. I'd be like, boy, what the heck happened to them? Boy, it's nice out. Yeah, it's okay. Th these people, it's like, are you kidding me? Get a clue, will you? Does it take too much to like be in a positive frame of mind and be in a good mood? I don't think so. Remember this. God's word and his Holy Spirit will always agree. Always. They will not contradict each other. So if you think that the Holy Spirit is telling you one thing to do, right, and you're not sure, you go to his word and you confirm it or you prove it out. God bless you. Some people chase after prophets. God doesn't say that who's ever led by prophets. He said he'll lead you by his spirit. His spirit and his word agree. If you seek the Lord for wisdom and you're asking him for wisdom, expect him to give it to you and expect that what he tells you to do will line up with his word. It's not going to go against it. Okay, so what if you say, well, I don't hear from him. He's not telling me. Oh, do you, do you read his word? Well, not really. I don't have time for that. Okay. Well, guess what? He is his word. Jesus became the word. This is him in the word form. He's also in here. So if this agrees with this, doesn't that make sense? Don't let the devil steal the word that was sown, though. You remember the parable of the four types of seed that were sown? You remember that? Let's go over to Mark, because I definitely don't want you to fall asleep on me. Good thing Paulie isn't here. I'd have to wake him up. Mark chapter 4, and let's go to um, 18. Okay? So here's what it says. It says... Now, now, this is going about the parable of the sower, and, you know, some were sown on certain types of ground, right? So, 18 and 19 says, Now, these are the ones that were sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. It becomes unfruitful. The message reads like this. It says, the seed cast in the weeds, it represents the ones who hear the kingdom news, but they're overwhelmed with worries and all the things that they have to do and all the things that they want to get. And the stress 
strangles what they heard, and nothing comes of it. So, if you sit here and you hear this message today that I believe God gave me for a timely message for you, and you got excited about it, know this, that the enemy wants to steal that word that you just heard so that it doesn't get planted down in here so that nothing becomes of it. Don't let them do it to you. Stir yourself up. Remember a couple of weeks ago, the Lord gave me that illustration about the paint? You know, when you get all those different colors that are squirted in, you know, because it's like color-coded and it's computerized, and they put all these different colors in the paint can. If all they did was squirt it in there and they never mixed it in, you could never apply it because it wouldn't come out the way it's supposed to. You need to stir yourself up and stir yourself up by reminding yourself what the Word says and by reading the Word, and then you can apply it to your life. That's the way this thing works. Amen? So, if you lack wisdom, if you lack wisdom, ask, believe, so that you can receive. You know, we sang some good songs today pertaining to healing, pertaining to God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom. The enemy is defeated. And he knows that he is. He knows that he is. It's like you entered into a fight in a boxing ring and the fight's been fixed and he already knows that he loses. He's not too happy about it. So he's not going to fight fair. He really won't. So you need to be aware of those things. Amen? So like I shared with Pastor Artie, I had to believe it was a short, powerful message that I believe would help you today. Did it help you? Yes. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Pastor Artie.